poetry is, is such a, a beautiful way to connect and it's accessible. We need yoga in schools, we need meditation in schools, and we definitely need poetry in school. I want little girls especially to see that a real life poet exists in their city and that it's possible. I don't hide inside my poems. I, I put everything out there. If you read my books, you know I've been married, I've been divorced, I've been heartbroken, I've been full of joy, I've traveled, you know where I've gone. And I feel like I'm just really getting started. Just yeah. hair more. It's so good to see you. I feel like we have a lot to talk about. Yeah. And, and I was looking back even about how to describe all mm -hmm. that you have done. So I'm like, well, she's an artist. She yeah. is a poet laureate. Yeah. She is a writer. She's a performer. You're the voice of the Pure Michigan campaign and now yeah. a filmmaker. A filmmaker. And so when do you sleep? I, I guess don't. is the question. Well, you know, because we both have seniors. So there's no That's sleep right, for in high school. Year. It makes you... Wow, it's really a moment in time. It is. And it especially is. for everything that you're achieving right now. I was, it's emotional, too. I've been crying. So I think I'm crying about my son. I'm also thinking about my life and my career mm -hmm. and what I've been able to accomplish as a single mom for 18 years. And now with my brain space, I think that's going to come back to me in the fall, perhaps when my son goes off to college. Um, you know, people used to call it the empty nest, but I was like, the nest is going to be empty because I don't think I'm going to be in him very much, you know. You'll like, be following him. Uh, no. <laughs> See where or, he is. <laughs> or I might be in Jamaica or, you know, West Africa or wherever. And, and, and also, like, as a creator and a writer, I'm going to be able to have just a little more time. You know, because when you're taking care of family, you're taking mm -hmm. care of other people, you are never first. Mm -hmm. So I think this will be the first time in my life because I also have a 29-year-old earth son that I raised in my first marriage. So I raised, helped raise Omari when he was very young and, Motherhood has been a part of the journey the entire time, anything I've made. And so I don't know, what am I going to do when I don't have to pick up someone from school or drop them off and get up at six in the morning anymore, every morning? Mm. Now, if I get up early, it's just because I want to, um, because maybe I want to go work out early. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's deep because I remember, I think Erica Badu was online talking about, you know, once... Not, not just not able to have babies when you no longer even want to anymore. Like, it really changes your life when you're like, okay, motherhood is, is a lifelong thing. I talk to my mom every day. Absolutely. It doesn't, you don't stop being mom. But as you watch them grow and become adults, it does, like, make you go, okay, well, who's this girl? <laughs> and what does she want to do now? Exactly. You know, you and I have talked that I am a solo parent raising yeah. three teenagers after my husband yeah. passed away. Yes. And you find this role that um, yeah. it has to come from almost, I think, a different part of you and your sense of self does go to the side yeah. and not because you want it to, but because there is a need. Yeah. Um, but it informs, I think, for me and it, I think for you has informed so much of what your art has That's been right. and how you move in the world. That's right. I mean, how, how I, what I write about, you know, motherhood made all the poems come in a whole different way. You look at the world different, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I am excited, to be honest. Like, you know, it's like you almost feel guilty about the excitement. I'm happy for my son. He's living, he's going to go live his dream and he's off to Cal Arts. <laughs> which, is, which is amazing. Yeah. But it's, it's hard to be sad when they are doing what they want and well, what they should, this next step. Well, we set, the them, next we set step. them up for these spaces, right? I mean, my son has seen enough of the world with me as a poet and writer, and even as a young mm -hmm. poet himself, performing in like Shanghai and Jamaica and doing shows with me all over the country. And so it's time for him to become who he is without Jessica Kilmore being around. And that, that needs to be, that's, that's hurts. If that pulls on my heart. Yeah. I know that's really important. And I'm gonna, I can't wait to see like, a year after he's in college for that year, who comes home? You know, like, exactly. Like what's going to happen? Yeah. I feel like that, no, that, that we're going to be seeing this parallel evolution mm. because you now are yes. on a path, in yeah. a, a different path. And I want to talk about a couple of things of, of where you are right now. First yeah. of all, where we're sitting, which is the kitchen oh, yes. uh, by Cooking with Q in yes. the new yes. center area. Yes. And uh, Kiana Brown is amazing at yes. what she does. But this, this space mm. was part of a new film. Yes. That you wrote, that you were acting in, and yes. it's going to be premiering at the American Black Film Festival in yes. just a couple of weeks in Miami. Yeah. Uh, taking on a lot of different projects. Yeah, Jessica. yeah. Feature film, he looked like a postcard. So I wrote um, some of the film before. The, I wrote it years ago. It was an idea that I had as a, just a long poem. Um, it was, it's actually based on a real, some of it, like very real life. Um, not just the motherhood story, which is like the core of the story. It's about a mother coming back home to find her, her voice again, to find herself again with her then 10-year-old son who was played by my nephew, Jaden Anthony Moore. So he plays my 10-year-old son. 
And uh, he was spectacular. First time acting, he auditioned for the role for Kasim Basir, who's on my fabulous director. And um, I, it was funny as I wrote it, and then I, it was pandemic. So I had a little more time in my hands. Right. So Kasim was in town from L.A., living in L.A. at the time. And I said, I have this script. You know, can you give me some notes? Is it, I want to know, is it okay? Is it good? Should I keep going? So he's like, I'm coming over. I want to talk about your film. He came over, he, and I had my notebook out. And I was ready for my notes. In the, and he said, I love the film. I love the story. I love the characters. I want to direct it. And You're like, wait, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, yeah. what is now? I was like, you <laughs> stop <laughs> it. And he was like, no. He said, you could develop the script, but it's good. You have a core thing here. Can you find a producer? And so, so became my work is like, let me care, who's in my Rolodex? Who do I know? I know people in film. I know producers. Mm -hmm. So we, we locked down a producer. Um, that producer unfortunately didn't work out. Then we locked out another producer out of LA. And it's then, kind of a business, though. It's a business. Task. I learned. And yeah. the, the thing that I did that I'm really, really proud of is I raised all the money for the film with um, about <laughs> ten people. Yeah. Um, who? Because I never, as an artist, asked people for anything. So my first investor was just my friend. I was in San Francisco talking about my film idea, and my friend Lasana said. Jessica, did you write it? I said, I wrote it. And it's about a poet, and she meets a painter, and she gets a postcard under her door, and she sees him at an art gallery, and you know they fall in love, but it's a self-love story. And he was like, I want to invest. And I was like, okay. And he's like, well, I have $150,000. And I was said, what? <laughs> and so I wasn't sure if I believed him. I was like, yeah, right. And I was like, he hadn't even seen the script. So, yeah. that, so what I learned from that process Eve Ensler is one of my, my investors who wrote Vagina Monologues. I sent Eve Ensler um, the script and, and she said, okay, I'm going to come in. Is the lesson ask? Is the lesson mm. believe on the foundation that you have built for yep. yourself? Yeah, that, it's both. It's also ask. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't, and, and don't be afraid to ask like people who are not rich. So I, my people that my family gave me some money, my friends gave me money. Like they're not millionaires, billionaires, but working class people that maybe had some were, you know, privileged enough to have some money in the bank after COVID. Yeah. Cause I was shot it basically during the COVID time. We all had to have masks on and COVID tests. It was really intense. Um, but yes, what I realized is that they were investing in me. So that's when Lasana offered me the money. He hadn't even read the script. Mm -hmm. It's because he, he believed in me. And so it means a lot. And so it's, it's this really independent group of investors um, who come on board. I can shout, you know, some of them out. You know, I haven't yeah. really talked about it, but um, Sean Wilson, a Boys and Girls Club, um, Phil Cooley. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a group. Um, I think the other guy's name is Mike Johnson. I don't want to say his name wrong. Is Mike, and he owns Duo Restaurant in Southfield. It's like, these are business owners. My, um, my dear friend, Greg Jackson, who's a prestige Cadillac. I bought Cadillacs from him. He's my friend. Like, he's like, I believe in you. Just people in my circle. And, and um, your art. And in our art. And they really, the little bits added up. And so it's not a million dollar film. We, I raised about $400,000. I put in mm -hmm. 50 of my own. I did the Spike Lee thing. I was like, so the, a weekend, I had made payroll. And they were kind of looking at me. We brought in a Ginger Rochelle from L.A. to produce. And, and Casa and my, my core group got together. And they looked at me like, you need some more money. And I said, well, well okay, I have 50 K. Is that enough to make payroll? And they're like, that's it. I shoot the, let's finish making the movie. Yeah. That's how fast the conversation was. Cause I always bet on myself. I've been investing in myself financially my whole career. So the reason why I'm still here and still able to be a poet is because I didn't wait for people to give me money. I didn't wait. I invested in my publishing house, more black press. So now mm -hmm. more black press this year is more Black Press Harper Collins. Mm -hmm. So my first author, Brad Waron, is coming out in August. So I'm still busy with the business of publishing again. And I love publishing books and I love putting poets into bookstores and setting up book signings. So but now I can do it with distribution. And that comes because I believed in me when other people did not. Because everyone didn't always believe. And people still now question where I belong, right? Like what spaces what do you think belong about that to me? When when people still question that or I don't care. I just go and take over rooms. You know, I just, you know, I just did the shepherd where they just opened on the east side and, and it was, I don't know, a couple thousand people there and, and it was great. I like quieting a room with my voice. How do you go from just walking in and taking over a room? Yeah. Does that exist when you're 25? Does it exist when you're 35? Yeah. I mean, there's some, there's some things I have when raised in Detroit, you know, I have some fearlessness and some, some, something in my, in my gut. That makes me, I mean, I moved to New York at 22. I didn't know anybody except my cousin on the Lower East Side, who was from Detroit, younger than me, graduating from NYU. 
I ended up picking up my pickup truck and moving there. But I have to say my father. So my daddy was a fierce man from Alabama um, who came to Detroit and made himself into himself. I mean, he, I don't think he graduated from high school and he created Tom's Trucking Construction Worker and didn't work for anybody my whole time I've had him. Um, and I lost him in 94. So my daddy died in 94. I moved to New York in 95. And so that energy, if you believe in spirit and ancestors, like with me, he's been pushing me in my... Um, and so, I mean, that was a hard loss for me. Mm-hmm. It's still a hard loss for yeah. me. Uh, but he's on the cover of my first book. So I feel like he's been my angel. You know, people say that wind beneath your wings. Yeah. Like that, that I co- believe that. I believe in those things. Yeah. And so he's there. And I believe in higher powers. And I don't, I don't have a big team. Like, I am tired. <laughs> <to be honest. laughs> I'm looking for I'm an sure executive assistant right now. Like, the poet laureate. <laughs> Yeah, let's oh, wow. let's, uh, let's get to that. That's um, amazing. Because you were just named Detroit's Poet Laureate, yeah. and I thought it was great. Uh, Mayor Mike yeah. Duggan said um, that you are authentically Detroit. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And and if you're, most Detroiters from Detroit are, we're authentic people in the world. And so I think that's what people get from my work. Uh, women enjoy my work. I don't really leave anything um, hiding. It's, I don't hide inside my poems. Mm. I, I put everything out there. If you read my books, you know how I've been married. I've been divorced. I've been heartbroken. I've been full of joy. I've traveled. You know where I've gone. So I, even like I look at a rap artist, someone that's gone all over the world and they're still writing about their block. I'm like, dude, your audience, you're grown. You should let your audience grow with you. So I've taken my audience to South Africa, I've taken my audience to Berlin, to France. I write about where I've been. I've been to Brazil. I'm going to write about Brazil. I write about Detroit because I love Detroit and it's mm-hmm. home. But I've been in the world as a poet for a long, long time. And so and, and anywhere I've gone, it's like, you know, I'm always about the D. And so where did you get that tattoo? I was living in Atlanta. So it's probably like, yeah, I was missing home. I got this tattoo and did not get it in Detroit. Um, I got it in Atlanta. I was missing home. I got it in Southwest. And I don't know if he was telling me the truth. He told me this tattoo artist that proof, I think, got a tattoo from him. I'm not sure. Um, and so. Still looks good. I don't know. 2000. It was, I've had it for forever. You now have this platform. I mean, of course, you've had so many platforms. Yeah. But being the Poet Laureate in Detroit, Special. what do you think in bringing poetry and maybe even to a new audience? Um, yes. What's the, the bonus of that? It's deep because so I didn't realize people took Poet Laureate so serious. I have been talking to everybody in the streets. So like <laughs> it's like a level. I didn't think the celebrity could get more interesting. It has become more interesting, like yeah. in stores. People are, people are very excited that I'm the Poet Laureate. So I'm like, there's a th- th- there's two or three things that they're asking me to do. And there's like 200 other things I want to do. <laughs> so for me, being fun of young people is, is key. Mm-hmm. And so I want to be in the schools. I want little girls especially to see that a real live poet exists in their city and that it's possible to make a living and to go like I couldn't imagine had someone like me walked into at Cody High School had walked into the classroom like in Dezaki Shange like the or Nikki Giovanni the people like me exist that I'm here you can. Yeah. yeah and I look like this you know what I mean I look like this my hair is like this and I perform all over the world you know what I mean and so that, but also curriculum building on just on education as, a, as an educator. I want to see a poetry curriculum inside of Detroit, inside of Michigan schools for that matter. Why is poetry, I think, maybe scary for people? I don't know, because it's, the, it's ridiculous. It's a weapon for educators. Educate is such a good tool. It's so, I've used it in jails and prisons. I've used it inside of colleges. But in, I, so in Philly, they have this beautiful program called Philly Mural Arts. Mm-hmm. And I want to steal, borrow the Philly Mural Arts Initiative and bring it to Detroit um, and do what I call, they did with Sonia Sanchez, they did a peace haiku. But I want to do Detroit love haiku. I don't know why people are, poetry is, is such a, a beautiful way to connect. And it's accessible. I mean, not mm-hmm. all, you know, poems, some poems are like hard to get to. But what mm-hmm. I love about haiku, which is just five, five seven, seven, five, five my friends. This is the easiest can, thing to do. If you can count <laughs> syllables. So I've taught haiku to kindergartners. I've taught um, uh, haiku to young people that were dyslexic, that yeah. weren't strong readers. And you can empower a young person because if they can just count five, seven, five, then they can write a haiku. And so we're doing ourselves a disservice because a li- we have a literacy problem in this city. Mm-hmm. We have a literacy problem in this country. And so we can help literacy rates go up by helping us learn to read. And so I want to help with literacy rates going up. And I want to see my books inside these schools. 
and so on. In the la- in the time of the banned book, I would like we want our bodies back and all of my books to be in the libraries at the school. Yeah, you know, I think it was interesting. I talked to Nandi Comer last year oh, when yeah. she became Michigan's yeah, poet laureate, and and, and you know she talked about how maybe in schools they try to analyze too much about yeah. poetry instead of just poetry for poetry's sake and yeah, enjoyment sure. and the beauty of the yeah. verse and just find what connects to you, not mm. understand exactly. Find what no. you feel yeah. and just love it for and, what it is. And also it gives voice. Like I've done, I've been inside these schools at Western and Cody and DSA. I was doing a mentoring um, work there and working with young people. I don't care if they were football players. Everyone around me is writing a poem. Mm. I don't care if you're a good writer, strong writer, never wrote a poem. Because some kids are, that's all they got. They, some of our young people have a heavy households they're coming out of. The ability to write and journal and get it out your body mm-hmm. is such a healing mechanism. So we need it. We need yoga in schools. Mm-hmm. We need meditation in schools. And we definitely need poetry in school. And so that's going to be, I want poetry everywhere. I want it as a public art statement. And so I'm thinking when I'm done, in the next two years, my dream is that, like, I want poet, poetry on the murals. You know, I want, I want to see more, more language infused. The visual art is beautiful. I'm actually a part of a show right now that's at Detroit Contemporary. And when I leave you today, I'm going over to do a talk with Melba Joyce Boyd, um, Marsha Music, uh, Halima Cassell, Sabrina Nelson. We've um, paired poets and painters together. Oh, it's all women. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, and so I, but I built a conceptual art installation out of my yeah. work, because, and I want to do more of that. And I'm going to have more time now um, to do more visual. I love the interdisciplinary. This so. is what was really, um, I think, it was wonderful about you, Jessica, you. is to see the evolution and how you keep evolving and keep evolving. Yeah. I think as women in middle age, yeah. and I think a lot of women are listening yeah. to this yes. and seeing how there's always room for growth. That's there's right. always building, no matter where you are in life. Um, yeah. I think I sometimes get frustrated with seeing the list 30 under 30, it's ridiculous. 40 under 40, Isn't that and then it stops. Isn't there's really? no like... Good on you if you're in mid if you're mid fifties wow. and you have kept creating Come have turned things longevity. New, the longevity of it mm. and still pushing forward mm. or completely blowing it up and doing Come. something different. And that's the power. Yeah. And that's, and and thing is like about age, you know, people because when you're doing these interviews, like news are asking me how old are you? I was like, why don't you ask me what my favorite color is? Mm-hmm. It's not that interesting. It's only a way to put me in a box somewhere or where I belong or try to assess whether I'm successful or not. I've been successful for so long. Like in my twenties, I started a publishing house. I'd won Showtime at the Apollo. I traveled all over Europe and Brazil and parts of it. Okay, about I've been doing this life for a long time. But it's figuring out the growth. How the do growth. I continue to how grow? Do continue? How do I continue to find yeah. the different things that spark and stay my creativity? Beautiful. Hello, there and don't we? Because, oh, you don't, oh, by the way, you don't die please. at 40. No. Uh, you get better. You get yeah. smarter. You know how to eat better. You take care of yourself. The more you care about caring about yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I don't get it. You know, because I feel like I'm finally becoming a grown up. <laughs> <You know>, kind of. <laughs> like, I'm I still very, that. I'm still kind of very whimsical and silly, you know. Yeah. Um, and but also I don't my imagination is so vast and I feel like I'm just really getting started. Like it's a great achievement to pull a laureate. I'm like, OK, so now I was thinking now now what um, in the film? Like he looked like a postcard it was a great achievement. I mean, it's been hard. My post production was hard. It was mm. not easy to make this movie. Um, and a first time filmmaker. So, um, so that's when I also say thank you to Tobias Trevelyan, this amazing uh, co-star who's an mm-hmm. actor that's done countless movies and yeah. films who came on board to do this film with me. And Nick, Nikki Gilbert, who's the lead singer of Brownstone, who went to Cody High School with me. She's playing my best friend in the movie. And I knew I said, Nikki could do this part. She was in that black box theater with me and Cody. And so so I reached many back for her. Detroit connections. Yeah. And, so, and this is also a love letter to Detroit. It is a love letter to yeah. Detroit. And it's so we're, we're opening at the American Black Film Festival um, June 13th. Mm-hmm. But we are going to have a Detroit screening. So I will absolutely let you know sometime, I think maybe in July. Yeah. When I come up for air. Absolutely. What, I mean, I don't know when that's going to be, <laughs> by the way. What would you like to just, I mean, mm-hmm. I guess, what do you hope? For the next couple of years, I hate to say, what do you want to be doing in five years? Because I think I have that, some plans, though. You know, no, I, can, I do. I do have you. plans. I mean, it's my 20th anniversary of Black Women Rock, so mm-hmm. um, we haven't announced yet. But I'm telling you anyway that okay. we're doing the Fillmore Theater on August 31st. That's going to be awesome. That's awesome. Congratulations! But it's also also not going to be easy. It's yeah. almost 3,000 seats in that place, so it's the biggest venue we've done in Detroit, and we are elated. We're excited that the Fillmore is coming on board to do this with us. And so I need everyone to show up for that. Yeah. It's going to be a master blaster. Um, but I want to, there's, there's things I have to write. Uh, I'm just trying to write. There's an opera, a fledged opera that I'm working on. Um, I can't say what it's about, but I'm working on an yeah. opera. And I, I want to work in the libretto space. 
I didn't I didn't know I could be a librettist. There's a um, short libretto that I'm writing right now with a composer in Canada and my friend Wendell Patrick, um, two pianists. Um, I, I love opera and I'm in love with um, when the Malcolm X opera came and I got to meet the lead opera singer, um, Devon Tynes. He became a good friend and I was just blown away the possibility of us collaborating mm -hmm. and we performed last year with um, the Detroit Symphony Orchestra together. So I'm just, I'm boundless and I'm excited about what else is going to happen with my brain. Like I, so there's plays I want to write. I want to do another film. So I, this film's going to premiere. It's a beautiful love letter to Detroit. It's a love story, a self-love yeah. story for women. So the thing you're talking about is for those women because serendipity, the character, is in that space where she's been successful and she's coming home. And I was in that space in Detroit. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I left the marriage. I came home and I had to figure my life out. And I had to decide, was I just going to go get a job or was I going to continue to be a poet? And... And I knew that I was possible, like even if anyone else, no one else did, because my family even was looking at me like, what are you about to are do? You kidding? <laughs> like, what are you gonna do in Detroit? I'm like, I'm gonna be a poet because I'm a poet and I'm gonna figure it out. And, um, I, you know, I was at the Lofts of Merchant Road with King as a Baby with, on an air mattress, but I had valet parking. It was fantastic. Jessica Hairboard, <laughs> you have figured it out, my friend. And, I'm still um, figuring it out. And you yeah, have as we're well. Still, Listen, we're all still figuring mom's it out. Mom's got it going oh, yeah. on. We figure it out because we know how to balance all the things. Um, we try. But, but more to do. Yeah. More to do. There's, my children's Always. book is coming out in January 2025. My first children's book, Our Crown Shines, uh, for Ketanji Brown Jackson. It's about Supreme, the first black woman yeah. Supreme Court justice. So I wrote a, a, a poem that's turned into an illustrated poem. Uh, for, for children. And so I want to be in front of kids. That's, you know what I mean? That's so good. Thank but, you for the time because yeah. I know you don't have a lot of it. No, but I, I'm happy to talk but to you always. This conversation is inspirational to me yeah. and I know it will be for a lot of other people. So thank thanks you. for bringing all of yourself into this space thank for you. us. Always. So, thank you. Thank you. Hey, come to the film premiere. You should come oh, to well, Miami. I would, oh, God. <laughs> all right. Sorry. I'm not working. I'm going to Miami. Miami. Yeah. Yes. Look. <laughs> thanks. Come to the Detroit screening, please. All right. Thank, thank you. Sure. Yep. Thank you.